Um, welcome to all the devotees and disciples and all well-wishers of His Holiness Chandramoli Swami Maharaj. Uh, we are very hap happy to have you on the call today. Um, thank you, Guru Maharaj, for your association. And uh, please accept our humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to your holiness. And all glories to the assembled devotees um, on this call. So before moving on to our session today, uh, we have some ground rules on the, uh, for this session. Um, so, so please be uh, on mute and you can keep your camera on and uh, please be mindful of your movements. And also uh, if you have any questions uh, or comments or realizations, you can just direct them to um, Anjali Mataji. Uh, and also you, uh, if you want to ask uh, yourselves you can unmute and uh, uh, ask your question. Um, and, and we'll try to answer all your uh, questions today. If not, um, there is one more session. Uh, and uh, tomorrow is also there are more sessions. So we can try to answer your questions. What, and, time, is the, what time is the second session today? Second session is um, 4 o'clock UK time, Guru Maharaj. Okay, 4 o'clock UK time. And uh, as per donations, uh, we have Ekta Mataji uh, who is handling these donations and uh, this information is sent out in the email uh, to everyone who have registered. Um, and also, so now with, uh, without any further ado, I'll just like to hand over the call to Guru Maharaj and uh, I just want to announce that today's session will be the second part of the yesterday's topic, the Gita Nagari scheme. And thank you everyone for joining again. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please take over the call. Thank you so much. Om Magyan Timirandasya Kinajana Salakaya Chaksu Unnamitam Yena Tas my Sri Guru Vena Maha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutalai Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvase Sasunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Panchakalpa Dirupis Chakri Pasindu Deva Chapatitanam Bhavane Vyo Vaishnavi Vyo Namahola Maha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadat Harsi Vasari Gaur Bhaktarinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So I want to thank all the devotees for joining us for this session. And this uh, will be my last talk. And then Bhutta Bhavana will explain the principles that Srila Prabhupada established when he first began his ISKCON Society in 1960. Six, and that was the uh, seven principles that are the foundation for the expansion of all the activities within the ISKCON society. What I'm presenting is somewhat similar, but this was going back to a partic particular uh, paper that Srila Prabhupada wrote in 1948, known as the Conception of Gita Nagari. Um, the word Gita, in this uh, sense, really means divine. Although the word Gita, we know when we refer to Bhagavad Gita, we refer to it as the song of God, Bhagavad Gita. But uh, in this sense, it means divine or spiritual. And uh, Nagari means place, dwelling, or even the word city. The Prabhupada's vision for Krishna consciousness in the world was an overall uh, revamping of the entire social, political, moral, aesthetic, <laughs> ecclesiastical, uh, spiritual aspects of the entire society. Prabhupada's thinking was not limited to starting a spiritual movement that would become one of many spiritual movements in the world. And nor this was the uh, desire and the plan of the previous acharyas. It was about re-spiritualizing 
all of society in all aspects that society practices. And you can see when you hear Srila Prabhupada's classes, he talks a lot about political things. Sometimes you wonder if Prabhupada was a former politician in the way he speaks. He always talks about ruling kings, society, presidents, uh, organization. <clears throat> but he was trying to present or at least explain to us what is an anomaly or what goes on today as society's organization is simply a defunct default, the default at best, but defunct uh, presentation of human life. <laughs> uh, and we can see as society goes on, it's becoming more and more corrupt, degraded, sinful, and what we say dangerous. <laughs> and Prabhupada warned us about that. And so these four principles that made up his Gita Nagari conception, uh, holy books and holy names was the first, we mentioned that yesterday. Uh, drowning the world with spiritual literature about the nature of the personality of Godhead. Uh, expanding the Sankirtan movement to everywhere, doing Harinam and having Kirtans. The second aspect was having a place where people could come and uh, learn about the Supreme Lord, the temples. He's, he writes, the temples are not places simply of worship, they're educational societies. He says, we are, these temples are for educating the people in the spiritual principles that are the foundation for the success of the entire society. In other words, the eternal religious principles as mentioned in the Vedas, particular in Srimad Bhagavatam and in Bhagavad Gita. And it's interesting, we see as Srila Prabhupada patterned his conception of Gita Nagari after Gandhi, who patterned his whole plan for the revamps of, the revamping, revamping of society based on the Bhagavad Gita. Everything that uh, Gandhi did was in connection with the words of Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Prabhupada did the same thing, but he expanded the, the principles even to the principles within Srimad Bhagavatam. So these temples, and Prabhupada not only established temples, but in a grand way, deities, storefronts, preaching centers, places where people can worship and especially hear the message of Krishna coming through these, these eternal religious scriptures. In other words, it was about education. We are an education society. We are not a, we're not a religious society. Our education is spiritual. And uh, we practice a type of religion means that we follow in the footsteps of Krishna, who is giving us the principles of eternal uh, happiness through the process of realizing him through the, through the process of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and learning about him through these different eternal religious scriptures such as Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. And then the, the third one was raising people up who are in the lower stage. And this third principle, which was called by Mahatma Gandhi, the Hari John movement. Hari means Lord, John means followers. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi had this idea of raising up the lower people of society called the Bungis and the Chamars uh, to give them equal status with the rest of the society in order for them to practice worship and to have the facilities that they needed in order to live in the, their material life. That was Gandhi's idea and he started this whole village program of self-sufficiency and education based on that. Fortunately, after Gandhi, unfortunately, after Gandhi left, the whole system that he had started 
never perpetuated. There was no one to follow and it just died from there. And then we went into a very secular type of materialistic society right after the so-called independence of India in 1947. Um, and now, um, this this Harijan movement, which was based on giving people initiation and educate them in a Brahminical culture. In other words, changing people from uh, a more secular, degraded type of lifestyle to become Brahmins, <laughs> to have all good qualities, to worship the Supreme Lord, to be truthful, to be clean, to be... Uh, tolerant, to be patient, to be concerned about the welfare of others, to be an ideal person. Prabhupada also said that when he was asked, how can you uh, tell who is an actual devotee? Prabhupada said he's a perfect gentleman, perfect lady. In other words, he gives respects to all and has all of the good qualities that people aspire for. But then now, the last part of Prabhupada's movement, which Prabhupada wasn't able to be here long enough to fulfill, although he spoke about it, it's quite interesting and in some, time, in some sense controversial. Controversial in the sense that even within our society, the question of the need for this is somewhat ambiguous or unclear on how to do it and in the same way. Although Prabhupada outlined everything in a very practical sense, uh, the society hasn't really been able to really put the energy, time and education needed in order to focus on this last part of Srila Prabhupada's mission, which brings everything together in a social environment where the religious activities can flourish where the spiritual activities can flourish. And this was the fourth four thing. This was based on uh, Gandhi's idea of the caste system. Gandhi was opposed to the so-called caste system. Of course, the word caste system has no place anywhere in any literature. It was created by the Brahmins. Now, what is it? Uh, caste really means class in one sense, a class society where there is no social division. This was what Gandhi wanted, but this is somewhat artificial because Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita chapter, Varnya Mana Shrista Guna Karma Vibhaga Saha Tasya Ham Kardanam Kartaram Apimam Vidyeda Akardam Avyayam. And the translation is, according to the three modes of material nature and the work associated with them, the four divisions of human sighted are created by me, Krishna speaking. He said, and he says, although I am the creator of this system, you should know, know that I am yet the non-doer of being unchangeable. So these four aspects, Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Sudra remain dormant within the society. Dormant means that people are not following it, nor do they know what it is, nor do they know how to awaken it. And uh, so Krishna later on in the 18th chapter describes the qualities of the Brahmins, the qualities of the Kshatriyas, the qualities of the Vaishyas, and uh, ultimately the qualities of the Shudras also. So Prabhupada wanted to, as he said in his lectures on this particular, he wanted to establish this uh, Daivi Van Ashram. He said the fourth item is much, the national division of human races is artificial. In other words, nationalistic division of human races where people are divided by country. You know, people are Africans, they're Americans, they're Chinese, they're Indians, 
Slovenians, whatever. This is artificial, this division. Prabhupada wrote a letter to Deputy Prime Minister Dr. Sadar Patel in 1949, outlining his idea for a um, society that was free from these divisions. And then he said, the Gita Nagar concept will harmonize with sweet relations between man and man, man and God, man and the world. At such time, only the United Nations effort will be established in a peaceful way. The dream of a casteless society. So what, what Gandhi dreamed of only can be done when we harmonize the relationships based on Krishna's words in the Bhagavad Gita, <clears throat> the four varnas, and ultimately hey, the four ashrams. So in 1977, August 10th, this is approximately three months before Srila Prabhupada departed the world, he said, I have only done 50% of what I want to do. In other words, he established temples, he, he developed the book distribution and the, uh, the Harinam program initiations, they were going on. Now he wanted to do what is called the Ban Ashram. He says, the farms have to be done. If they are established, then we can establish Ban Ashram. <clears throat> And then Prabhupada described <clears throat> the four types of Van Ashram, Vedic Van Ashram, Dormant Van Ashram, Materialist Van Ashram, and ultimately in Kali Yuga, Daivi Van Ashram. It is a verse, Van Ashram Acharya Vata, Purushena Param Puma, Vishnu Arati Panta Nanyata Toshit Karanam. One can worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vishnu by proper discharge of the principles of Vana and Ashram. Now you might say, well, this is external. It is, but you'll see what this is leading to. And then the rest of the verse, and this is from Vishnu Purana, which is the Purana and the mode of goodness. And the Prabhupada says, there's no alternative to pacifying the Lord by the execution of the principles of Vana Ashram. That's the rest of the verse. And then when Prabhupada was in Russia, speaking to uh, Professor Katasky, Prabhupada made that, that this Varna and Ashram is everywhere dormant within society, not only in India, but here in Russia also. But it's prevalent, as Prabhupada said, in other forms. And then Prabhupada outlined the four, the Brahmins, the intelligent class of men, the advisors, the Kshatriyas, the administrators, the rulers, the martial spirited class, the Vaishnavas, the productive society, and the Sudras, the workers. Now you might wonder what's this leading to because we see we're not talking about any of this in our society. But what Prabhupada, was saying leads up to what he wanted to do. And he said that this Van Ashram is ultimately the creation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, as we heard from. So what is not Van Ashram is the, what Gandhi was against and what Prabhupada in, uh, was always speaking against, and that was this false idea of caste system, that if one is born in a Brahmin family, then one automatically is a Brahmin. If one is born in the family of Kshatriyas, one is automatically. Of course, in Western countries, there's no such designation. People are not, um, people are only labeled by, uh, by uh, what kind of body you have. In other words, your nationality and your economic divisions. 
So you have the poor and the rich, and then you have the different varieties of cultures within society. That's mostly Western society. They don't talk about. But then you see within society, you'll see people are who are an intellectual class. You see people who are a, or a ruling class, organizing class. There are people who are farmers, bankers, and uh, uh, those who work with animals. And then you see the general common workers. So that's there. So Prabhupada outlined what is there in a very obscure way, but it's not at all being developed. And therefore, societies in chaos. But then Prabhupada came up with something different. He, he wasn't interested in the materialistic Vanarsham or the vitiated caste system or any of these things. He wanted to establish Daivi Vanarsham. And that is to educate devotees in different categories of varnas with the idea of engaging that propensity in the service, therefore, in devotional service. Therefore, you have what is called a society that is socially divided within these four groups. People are in one of the four categories and they're serving the Supreme Personality of Godhead accordingly. Now, when Fra Prabhupada's movement first started, Prabhupada didn't um, go along with the whole idea of Vanarsham. He said, you know, society is too upside down. He, would, he said, he said, this was from 1966 when he first began his movement to 1973. He said, forget Van Arsham. Chanting Hare Krishna is the panacea for everyone. He made that statement around 1973. Mm -hmm. And then, and then again, he, finally, he said, therefore, this is the panacea for everyone to engage in Krishna conscious and to chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. This is the only remedy. Now you cannot introduce this system of Vanashram. And this statement was made on December 30th in a lecture in 1968. But then Prabhupada changed in 1974 completely. He said, now we must establish Vanashram. Humanity is in chaos. The Vanashram College has to be established where everywhere there is a center with a college to train. Now in 1974, Prabhupada gave a morning walk conversation in Vrindavan. It's one of his longest. He actually made three, actually two different discussions, one in March 12th and then again in March 14th of 1974. The one in March 14th was quite interesting. You could listen to it over and over. You'll see what Prabhupada's vision was for the whole world. But particularly, he said, we can't really change the world unless we establish it in our society initially. We have to show the ideal society within our ISKCON world. Otherwise, there will be no, our preaching will have no effect. But Prabhupada wanted us to establish this Van Ashram system. And the first one was the Van Ashram College. And Prabhupada said then, the trained Brahmins within our society, those who have Brahminical uh, status, who are educated in our philosophy, should be the teachers in the college. And they can teach every particular type of activity. They can teach to cook, they can teach to clean, they can teach to, um, they can teach philosophy, they can teach 
um, any practical service that is done within our society, they can teach to a minister, they can teach martial arts, they can teach any everything that's needed within the society. They can teach how to do farming. So he said the collective Brahmin culture within our society should be versed in all of the activities of the society in such a way that they will be the teachers and will teach Brahmins to become Brahmins, will be, teach devotees to become Brahmins, teach devotees the principles of the activities of the Kshatriyas and the principles of the activities of the Vaishnavas. The Sutras don't need training like that. So Prabhupada said, because if people are in chaos, how will they be able to understand this philosophy? It requires a cool brain. He said, and he made an interesting statement. He said, Van Ashram is a must for us and in the world. That was in 1977. And this is an interesting statement. This was also probably the most powerful discussion on Van Ashram. It was a room conversation in February 14th, 1977, where Prabhupada was with um, Hari Sari Prabhu and um, Sacharup Maharaj at the time. And uh, Prabhupada is discussing his plan for the rest of the society. He said this Vanashram Dharma should be established to become a Vaishnava. He said it's not so easy to become a Vaishnava. And then he goes on to, to conjecture. If Vaishnava, to become a Vaishnava is easy, then why are so many falling down? It is not easy. So for in our society, devotees were coming. They were engaging in devotional activities. They were chanting the Hare Krishna mantra and following the rules, but they were not staying steady. And many of them were either marginalizing their Krishna consciousness or even sometimes leaving the movement. So Prabhupada saw that we have to establish this principle of, of Varna and Ashram. Now, I'll just divert a little bit away from Prabhupada's instructions. And where Prabhupada says in other places that everyone in this age of Kali, because this age is so degraded, no one's propensity is, uh, is, is actually comes by birth. It requires training. It requires education. It requires education and then practice in order for it to develop. So therefore, he said, Kolo Sudra Sambhavan, that is the statement in the Shastras, that everyone is born in a more or less Sudra or below category. Even those who are born in so-called Brahmin families, Kshatriya families or Vaishya families, in order for them to practice their Varna, they have to uh, be educated in the principles of the activity, along with practical application. When Prabhupada established the Dagorakul system, he wanted that to be a place where the teachers would observe the students and their particular natures, and then learn that particular nature and learn how to engage that student in practical devotional service. For instance, when Prabhupada's mission first started, he emphasizes, emphasized the whole principle of Brahminical training. Everyone comes and becomes a Brahmin. And that's when Prabhupada gave Brahmin to everyone after a couple of years. And even to and anyone who stayed in the society for a few years became a Brahmin. So Brahm, Prabhupada's idea was to train everyone Brahminical, but then he saw it wasn't happening. For instance, in our Gurukul, uh, one Gurukul teacher was reporting his experiences with the children. 
I believe this was in Dallas. And uh, I think it might have been Dallas or might have been in Vrindavan. I think it might have been Vrindavan. Where the Gurukul teacher was saying, we have this one student, Srila Prabhupada, he's just very disruptive. Uh, he named the boy. Uh, he doesn't want to learn and he causes problems with the other students. And, he, and uh, everything we do to try to uh, restrict him or educate him doesn't work. So Prabhupada could understand after hearing the explanation of this boy and his activities, he says, he's not suitable for medical training. Engage him in other ways, put him on the farm and let him do menial services. And that way he can do something practical. Don't try to educate him in the philosophy or in the principles that make up the nature of a Vaishnava. Just give him practical service. So, and Prabhupada writes in the first canto, I believe it's the eighth chapter of the first canto, that um, it's the duty, you know, he, he makes it clear, it's the duty, I don't have the, the statement in front of me, but I remember it. It's the duty of the spiritual master to carefully observe his disciples and see what is their particular nature after observing them in activities for a while and then learning how to place them in services that will complement their nature. And he said, this is important. And that way we can at least engage people according to their nature. And when you're engaged according to your nature, either Brahman, Kshatri, Vaishya, or you might say there are persons whose nature is simply to do work. They don't have any of the qualities, even in the dormant stage of the higher caste. So then engage them in just in practical devotional activities, cleaning and construction and various types of labor. But then again, in order for the social development of the society to go on, there has to be a division. And people within that have to be trained according to that particular type of varna. So, um, and you'll see, um, those of you who've been around ISKCON for a while, you'll see sometimes people who are engaged in one way don't have a propensity for that service. They do the service simply because this is either something they like or because they have been asked to do that particular service. And therefore, a lot of times the service doesn't go on in the right way. Like if you have, you know, if you have the Kshatriya nature worshiping the deities, um, you might get a lot of organization, <laughs> but you also might get a lot of conflict on how the organization goes on. <laughs> because Kshatriyas have a tendency to want to be in control and organize things accordingly. And so when you have more than one Kshatri in one place doing that, you have chaos in terms of how things go on. Brahmins work together as a group. They usually discuss the philosophy and then come to some conclusion about what is the actual understanding and apply that to different situations. So they can solve problems or at least give advice on problems or the direction in our society simply through philosophy and through uh, practical understanding. So Prabhupada wanted this Van Ashram College and you'll, you'll see in this, in this lecture on uh, March 14th, 1974, he speaks with Ridayananda Maharaj mostly, and Maharaj is asking questions and Prabhupada's responding on how this Van Ashram College should be organized to train Brahmins, Kshatriyas, and Vaishyas. So far, our society has only been emphasizing the Brahminical culture. And 
a lot of times it just doesn't work because people are not inclined in that way. So in order to understand the inclination, therefore education has to be there. So Prabhupada wanted this Van Ashram colleges to be established in each and every center as a means for uh, awakening people's propensity and understanding how to engage that propensity in devotional service. And that will make the devotee happy when they're engaged according to their nature. That. But then the next, next aspect of this whole Van Ashram is Prabhupada said, only on these farms can we demonstrate the full Van Ashram system. If we have far, if the farms become successful, then the whole world will be enveloped by Krishna consciousness. So in 1977, when Prabhupada was quite ill at the time, and this was towards September, Prabhupada decided to uh, leave Vrindavan and go to Gita Nagari in in the West, in, in Pennsylvania, in the United States. So um, in doing that, he arranged for himself to go first to London. And Prabhupada's health was really diminishing. And there were many signs externally of his health. And he was being taken care of quite regularly by his devotees. But still, he was determined to get to Gita Nagari. And he said, I want to show you how to establish this Van Ashram based on this, these farm communities. Unfortunately, Prabhupada's health deteriorated so much in 1977 in, in October, the end of September, October, and that he could not continue to travel and he went back to Vrindavan. So he wasn't able to uh, show what he wanted to show. And Prabhupada, uh, he said, in the cities, we are interested in preaching, but we cannot present the ideal Van Ashram system there. This is only possible at the farms. So they are important. And this was a letter excerpt to Tamal Krishna Goswami and to Hari, da, to Hari Sari Prabhu regarding Srila Prabhupada's statement. Again, August 10th, 1977. So we can see during this last year that Prabhupada was with us, how much he talked about and wanted to accelerate the whole idea of these farm communities. He says these cities won't last. He said the cities will eventually crumble and people will be in chaos as the demoniac society, society increases more and more. We're seeing a little sample version of that right now as this co-virus, this coronavirus and the political, the, politi the politics behind the co-virus are really disorienting people in various ways. And people are looking for some solutions, some respite from this whole situation. So we're seeing even now the economic situations within the cities are starting to crumble. But people are not even able to go work at their occupation. And therefore, in many places in the world presently, the governments are supporting people's economic needs because all the business, many of the small businesses, practically all of them are closed down in many, many countries. So Prabhupada sort of predicted this. He said these cities will eventually start to become places of inhabitants of just crime and other features of Kali Yuga, <laughs> as he described it. So he wanted to establish these farm communities. He said, this is the future of our movement. He said, um, again, back to Van Arshram, he said he wanted to also include 
not only Brahminical culture, but also Vaishya, like that, and Sudra and all that. So Prabhupada really, really pushed this, um, this Van Ashram College and farm communities as, and he said, a classless society can only exist when all the individuals that identify themselves as servants of Krishna playing the accepting roles within the Varnashram as a, dra as a drama or a play. And this is interesting because this helps us to clearly understand what Prabhupada is saying. We are not Brahman, we're not Brahmins, we're not Vaishyas, we're not Sudras, we're not Kshatriyas. We have the statement that is supported by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself. He says, I'm not a Brahmin, I'm not a Kshatri, I'm not a Vaishya, I'm not a Sudra, I'm not a Brahmachari, I'm not a Sannyasi, Trihastu, Vanaprasa. What am I? Gopi Bhartar Badekamalayor Dasa Dasa Anu Dasa. So our real and only identity, and I'll emphasize that word only, is that we are eternal servants of Krishna. The material roles we play are simply roles in order to, to develop the social and environmental situation that is needed in order to live in this world. And these roles are important. And if people are expert in those roles, then at the same time offering the results of the activities within the uh, roles we play as a service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, that is the uh, perfection of devotional service. To serve the Lord according to the different roles that you play, Brahman, Shatri, Vaishya, Shudra, whatever, even the ashrams, and offer everything as a service. So we are only servants of the Lord, but we are playing these various roles. The Prabhupada's vision for Van Ashram was really, really broad. Really, really broad. And, uh, but he said, establish these farm communities. And so what well, this is, seems to be, uh, not seems to be, it is the future of our society. Um, where simple living, I thinking Krishna consciousness. Uh, when devotees hear this, oh my God, I have to move out of the cities. I have to give up my job. I have to take my kids out of the schools. I have to do all of this stuff just to live on a, in a way that I'm not sure I'll be able to be happy in that way. <laughs> well, it's not for everyone. But these, these particular farm communities are the foundations for developing the Van Ashram system, as Prabhupada said, Daivi Van Ashram, and also distance ourselves from dependence on the materialistic society. As long as the devotees are still con connected to and dependent on the materialistic society, we are in a marginal situation. We're in a precarious situation. If society collapses, we also collapse. <laughs> and Prabhupada could foresee that, that ultimately he wanted us to be independent and establish a microcosm of Krishna's vision for, the, for, for living within the big macrocosm of the world's situation today and eventually build that and show the world here is the ideal way to live. Simple living, high thinking. And of course, um, just two weeks ago, we did a four part presentation on farm communities, cow protection, uh, agriculture, and the whole lifestyle that is centered around that. But Prabhupada wanted us to understand deeper what it means to live naturally and not be so dependent on so many artificial things in order to live from day to day. Not only is it makes the practice of the spiritual aspect of our Krishna conscious difficult, 
but it's a challenge to the aesthetic, moral, and healthy lifestyle of the individual. So, um, and therefore, Prabhupada said, we have our we have our New Vrindavan community, we have our Gita Nagar community, we have our we have our Vrindavan, we have our Mayapur. These were the places that he put some emphasis in developing them, and also now it's being developed in some places. So um, without going into a long uh, discourse on the benefits of farm communities, which I did about two weeks ago for most of you who are online, but this is the culmination of the principle of the fourth plan of Srila Prabhupada, establish these farms and develop Van Ashram, establish these college. And then Prabhupada spoke so many benefits that come with living like that, and especially the benefit of not spending so much time just living. Um, when you live in a collective community, and everyone has their particular service, and it's all centered around a more natural lifestyle, then you don't work, you know, all day, nor do you work uh, all year. In fact, you only work a few year, months a year, establish your needs, and ultimately you can spend more time for educating children, for preaching Krishna consciousness, for um, um, chanting Hare Krishna. <laughs> so if we get a clear picture of Srila Prabhupada's plan, and it's being discussed by some leaders in today, um, I can actually say that in two places it's really developing under the guise of His Holiness Shiva Ram Maharaj in New Rajadam and under the guise of Ravana Swami in Govardhan Echo Village. These, if you visit either one of these places, you will see how Srila Prabhupada's movement is unfolding according to his particular plan. The only part of that that hasn't been developed yet is um, clearly instituting the principle of designation training people in the different varnas. So that has to be, and Prabhupada says, as the cities collapse, he said, the cities will collapse. He said then people in general will be coming to us looking for shelter. And we will be able to give them shelter through the principle of varna, not, not the spiritual principle. We will be able to engage them in some practical activity where they can make a livelihood out of it. And at the same time, since they're in the spiritual atmosphere with spiritual people, they'll gradually learn the importance of Krishna consciousness. And many of them will take it up. The Prabhupada is not simply a philosopher or a great spiritualist. He's actually a prophetic person who studied the scriptures, who understands Lord Chaitanya's movement as it unfolds, and who very clearly can see the downfall of the present materialistic society. And Prabhupada made very, what we say, sweeping statements about what will happen to this society. It's not possible for this society the way it's going to go on, because it's not based on anything real. Uh, when, you, when you base something on a false premise, that foundation eventually will crumble. What is the false premise? Economic development and sense gratification are the, the pillars by which the whole society moves. It all moves in these two directions, to increase the economy, to increase the facilities, and to enjoy the senses as much as possible. When such societies develop in such a way, people eventually become degraded because sense gratification doesn't satisfy and people become dissatisfied and ultimately you have so many problems in society which we have today uh, 
to the present world society is in somewhat of a crisis because it's all based on the wrong principle and therefore there's so much conflict, lying, cheating, going on and all, even amongst people who are decent, they have to lie and cheat in order to maintain themselves. So we have a, uh, all we have to do is listen to Prashila Prabhupada's instructions. I would highly suggest you listen to Prabhupada's Srimad Bhagavatam classes from the first canto. He describes a lot of this in his Srimad Bhagavatam first canto lectures, which he gave mostly in from 1972 to 1974. And he describes the, the what we say, the degraded nature of society. Uh, so what Prabhupada was not simply just a spiritualist, he had a vision for how to develop society in a progressive way based on devotion to Krishna and an economic principles that was based on what was necessary and at the same time, what could be used to further Krishna consciousness within the world like that. He wasn't against uh, business, but he was against business for simply for a selfish type of profit. Business should be used to maintain oneself, but at the any excess money used for business should be divided accordingly. Some should be kept for oneself and the rest should be used to propagate spiritual principles in the world <laughs> like that. So our movement is paropaka. Prabhupada uses that word many times, paropaka. It means to do good to others. The world cannot hardly think so much in that way, although that's the nature of the human being. The human being flourishes in their, in their qualities as a human being when they act for the benefit of others. But in acting for the benefit of others, if you don't know what the benefit of others are, and you simply create what is you think is the benefit of others, others may not benefit. Or if they do benefit, it's only in the short term. The ultimate benefit of others is to give people a lifestyle and an opportunity to fulfill that lifestyle by practicing Krishna consciousness and ultimately achieve to, to go back home, back to Godhead. So this was the fourth part of Srila Prabhupada's mission, farm communities, Daivi Vanarshram, Vanarshram colleges, education, and placement of devotees in different services according to their nature. Mm -hmm. A person can do many services or different types of services for a limited period of time. But a person, when they're engaged according to their nature, can stay in that service and develop it and make a wonderful contribution accordingly, like that. So Prabhupada saw that this is the need in order for our society to uh, continue and also to be strong enough and be an example for the rest of the world, like that. So again, we are not a religious movement. We are a spiritual educational movement. <laughs> That's why we have so many books, so much philosophy, so much discussion, so much uh, information coming from various sources on how to serve the Lord and how to live a life that is conducive to serving the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Prabhupada in the first canto mentions that a society is based, a successful society is based on three main principles. Brahminical culture, the Brahmins leading society by giving direction according to Shastra and according to practical advice. Uh, cow protection, the cow is the foundation for agriculture. It's also the foundation for aesthetic and moral development within society. We went into that 
a few weeks ago in our discussion how the cow actually creates an atmosphere of peace and uh, aesthetic and moral values just by the cow's presence, along with its practical use in agriculture. And then the third thing is the worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So in the, I believe it's the 17th chapter in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, Prabhupada talks about these three things have to be in place, although before you can have a perfect society. Cow protection, agriculture, one, verminical direction, two, and worship of the Supreme Personality of Godhead as the ultimate goal of all activities. <laughs> so, um, what I wanted to establish within this particular presentation is along with the information available is to show who this Srila Prabhupada is. He's a visionary. He's an empowered person that came to revolutionize the whole uh, society according to religious and spirit, eternal, eternal spiritual principles. Religion, yes, that's there, but spiritual principles are the foundation for the success of uh, the living entity's progress towards the goal of life. And living, if you're not living properly and you're trying to practice Krishna consciousness, you may do that, but you will find it is a great struggle. So Prabhupada also talked about the social environment that is required and therefore he said we must establish these farm communities. We'll still have our cities. He said the brahmacharis can stay in the cities. The sannyasis can travel from place to place. The grihastas mostly will be on the farms maintaining the farms. The brahmacharis can and sannyasis can occasionally come to visit the farms and spend some time there, but then their duty is to preach in the cities where people are, and the uh, sannyasis are meant to preach and travel all around the world. So he, uh, he also designated that way. And he said, for every city temple, we should have a particular farm community connected with that city temple, where devotees make uh, you know, people Krishna conscious, or at least we bring them in, and then we engage them by bringing them to our farms and engage them in practical activities like that. Because what can you do in the cities unless you live in the temple? Generally, whatever you can do outside is in connection to the secular society. You may be able to give some contribution in terms of your time and and monetary resources, but your lifestyle is still connected to the, so, to the social and political atmosphere of the secular society. And therefore we are very much affected. That's why people come to me and they come to all the leaders in society. You know, I don't know how to raise my children. You know, they're so much influenced by, you know, their, their, the society they're in or not only the children, how to take care of family members who are no longer able to produce. So all the aspects of living in society is covered nicely within this Vanashram principle of living within the farm communities and developing that principle as the future of our movement. I don't want to sound too much like I'm becoming too redundant here, but it's Prabhupada's particular vision for the world is really based on simple living, high thinking. That's a, a word or a line we used to use. Live simply, become Krishna conscious. If you're living too gorgeously and so much encumbered by various types of activities that are meant just to facilitate your living conditions, you don't have time for Krishna consciousness. And you're overcome with so many 
problems. <laughs> How to keep away the secularism at the same time practice Krishna consciousness in that environment. So that's for the brahmacharis, they can be mobile. The sannyasis, they can all, they're definitely mobile. That's, that's their particular the duty of a sannyasi is to travel from place to place. Duty of the brahmachari is to preach Krishna consciousness and set up educational programs to, ed, to enlighten people in the knowledge of our scriptures. These are all, these can be done anywhere, but for a lifestyle, it's the farms that where is the foundation for that. <laughs> And it's a great place to raise children, too. <laughs> okay. Um, I hope I didn't uh, go too far in this particular area. Anyway, there's much more that could be said in relationship to Prabhupada's plan for unfolding his last principle, which is still uh, only moving slightly in that direction. We have a long way to go. But the problem is that not everyone in our society is focused on this fourth principle. And uh, because of that, we're not moving. There are only a few leaders who are working on that directly. We have Bhakti Raghava Swami, who ever since he came into Krishna consciousness has been focused on that. He's traveling to different places, mostly in India, and giving seminars and lectures on farm communities, cow protection, simple living, agriculture. And he's getting a lot of, uh, what we say, uh, what's the word? He's getting a lot of uh, respect from people in high places. Now here's a Westerner who is so much into the whole Vedic concept that it makes the people born in the Vedic culture look like Westerners. Um, and he's writing books, compiling many of the teachings of Srila Prabhupada, referring to other sources in order to support his whole presentation. And he's established a couple communities in India. Um, I'm not sure what one is in one place in Maharashtra and another place somewhere else. But he, he does a lot of traveling and preaches this and these. Um, so he, there we have some of our leaders who are very much fixed on bringing other leaders are fixed in other areas of Srila Prabhupada's movement, such as book distribution, Harinam, or developing um, our temples in various ways. But there are a few devotees who really see the need to give this full attention. And it's the need of the time. We were awakened a little bit more to the Prabhupada's instructions by this, uh, this particular pandemic that is going on in the world. Uh, Krishna's kind of showing us uh, that, you know, Maybe you should be more serious about what your spiritual master has said <laughs> by giving us a crisis where, you know, living in the cities are like, means you can't even go out of your house now <laughs> in some places. There are people who are, if they come out of their house at the wrong time, they get fined, can travel from place to place. And people are thinking, oh, it will end soon. Well, good luck. That's not the plan. It's not planned to end soon. It'll go on. It's going to go on and on and on, and this lockdown will continue. So uh, this is, Prabhupada forewarned us. He said that the societies will start to crumble, and there will be problems on all levels. So therefore, we have to establish this fourth principle, the Vanashram system. Okay, I don't want to ber berate anybody too long on this principle. I just wanted to make a point with emphasis. So I'll conclude there and see if there's anybody would like to <clears throat> speak something in relationship. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful class and um, making us understand uh, 
um, important points and uh, Srila Prabhupada's vision about farm community and Daivi Vannashram and, and many more things. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Um, so we, I have, uh, we have some couple of questions here, Guru Maharaj. Um, shall I start with the questions, Guru Maharaj? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's from Radha Bhakti Mataji. Uh, she is asking, what should we do when we have a sense that we are not fulfilling the potential of our nature? In other words, we're doing some something and we're feeling that it's not our nature and we sense that this is not. Well, I guess the question means, uh, do you want to find out more about your nature or you actually know your nature but you're not engaged in that because you're engaged according to what is the need rather than what is actually um, the basic principle of how you can actually grow in spiritual practice uh, what should you do you should find out <laughs> Do whatever you can to learn a little bit more. And that's the role of a spirit. The role of the spiritual master is that he, he can see the propensity or the nature of a, his disciple and then uh, direct them accordingly. As we mentioned yesterday, when Prabhupada started the society, he wasn't so much interested in engaging people according to propensity. He just simply wanted to propagate temples, book distribution, Harinam, as fast as he could because Prabhupada knew, you know, his time with us could end at any moment. And he had too many signs in that direction. So he, he was engaging whatever energy was available and whatever need was there. So, um, yeah, but if you go, just like I'm in Slovenia here, and we have a few devotees who have farms. You go just across the border, we have a couple of devotees who have farms in Croatia also. And there's one devotee, he, he milks cows, he does agriculture, he makes cheese, he distributes it to the temples like that. But he, you know, he's practically a lone ranger and the rest of the devotees who have places, they're also basically alone. If you had farms with at least three or four different families on the farm, then you could actually develop something very uh, uh, practical in terms of living and having all the needs taken care of and at the same time offering some of the results to to the cities so um, i would say if you're not if you have a sense of you're not doing what your your nature is that sense is a type of uh, uh intuition where well, maybe i can in, be more effective in serving Prabhupada's mission and also developing in my own krishna consciousness if I was engaged in another way. So I would su suggest you go to the spiritual master or you go to someone and get some advice on how best you can serve. Of course, a lot of our services are centered around needs. That we have certain needs for family, we have certain needs for occupation. And so we also center our services around that. But then again, we have to look to the, uh, we're always talking about the future, but it seems like the future has become the present. It's no longer the future anymore. What Prabhupada said 50 years ago seems to be happening right now in terms of the social collapse. <laughs> But we're not, and Prabhupada wasn't the idea that we wait for everything to collapse and then we scramble and try to reestablish something else. He said, 
uh, unless we're situated nicely as society starts to fall apart, we won't have anything to give anything to others because we are also in the same situation. A lot of our pe people here are philosophy, but how are they going to apply it? How do you apply this knowledge? At least the knowledge that is meant to be applied in a practical living sense. We can only understand the philosophical terms in, in terms of our understanding of our relationship with Krishna. And that's important. And that's most important. But if we can't apply the philosophy to our lifestyle, then what's the use? <laughs> Okay. So, I hope it answers, uh, Radha Bhakti Mataji. Um, so, uh, so Radha Bhakti, did that did that help at all? Yes, very much. Thank you so much. Hi, Krishna. Hi, Krishna. Krishna. Uh, Guru Maharaj, there is one more question uh, from Archana Siddhi Mataji. It's nice to hear from the. Okay. Um. So shall I ask Archana Siddhi Mataji to ask her question, Guru Maharaj? You like, yeah. Mataji, you can unmute and ask. Yes, sir. yes, Guru Maharaj. Guru Maharaj, uh, thank you so much for an enlightening class. Um, uh, so uh, you said that our movement is not a religious movement. It's a spiritually, um, it's a spiritual uh, educational movement. But mm -hmm. somehow... Um, devotees are taken as uh, religious. They are taken as uh, fanatics, uh, considering like not eating prasadam, um, no meat eating, um, or uh, uh, you know things like that. So, are we presenting something wrong to them? Uh, are we not doing something right? Uh, what we're saying is that these things are beneficial for your spiritual and material growth. It happens to be a principle, but the principle has value. It's not just a principle, but it's a principle that has value. So we don't make rules and regulations simply to restrict or to encourage, but we make them because they're beneficial for the development of Krishna consciousness. If you are engaged in any aspect of meat eating, you're going to get a reaction for that. It's not that the person who kills the animal gets all the reaction. All the way down for seven people who are involved with that killing get a reaction for that. So we're telling, we're warning people, don't eat meat. Besides the fact that it's not always is not beneficial for health at the same time it's um it's karmically disastrous <laughs> you're building bad karma you're doing something that is hurting your principle of how to live happily you're suffering you're causing suffering simply by thinking you're enjoying so our principles which are vidis and nishetas, things to do and things to avoid, are meant to get us off the bodily platform and onto the spiritual platform. Yes. We're getting a nice view of a farm in Slovenia right here. And those of you who want to watch the video, it's going on here. Where is this place? Yeah, Abhiji mentioned it's in Slovenia, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. I can't remember being there. Does that help Arjuna City? Uh, this, this, yeah. I mean, yes. There's, there's reasons why we do what we do. It's just not like, well, we do what we do because we do what we do. 
Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yes, uh, but uh, it, it it's hard to explain these reasons uh, to um, um, friends or relatives. Well, I didn't say it was easy because if you're trying to teach people something that is not easily understandable. You can present them, but until they actually come to the point of actually want to, wanting to change and wanting to understand, things will continue the same way. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Gurudev. Hare Krishna. Yeah. Changing people means changing ourselves, really. The more we change ourselves, then we can be an ideal example for what we speak. Uta Bhavana Prabhu, please uh, enlighten us with some statement of enlightenment. Thank you, Shumaraj. Thank you, Prabhu, for just a wonderful class. I was just making notes and I was resonating with the last point you made also about changing people means changing ourselves. And the idea that, you know, it, I think we've really seen that in the last 12 months that if, if we're not well situated as a society and as individual devotees, we're not really in a position to help, help others so much. And I just wanted to, um, I'm sure you, you've had much more experience than I have of this, but sometimes even in our communities, I think this point about lifestyle and how we live is such a big thing that's often not really understood properly. And then if our lifestyle isn't set up in such a way that's favorable to our Krishna consciousness, we have a whole ro range of different challenges. And then what happens is, I'm like I, I had a communication with someone and their son, I think they, they feel that their son needs some direction. And I think it's also linked to the fact that if, if we're not conscious that the lifestyle should support our Krishna consciousness, then as you said, the lifestyle will become so problematic, it will make Krishna consciousness very hard to practice. And what I've noticed is that when, it's, when, when that happens, devotees don't think that my lifestyle isn't favorable. They think that Krishna consciousness is difficult. So it, right. it kind of, it's perceived that, you know, if I didn't have this Krishna consciousness to do, everything would be easy rather than actually the way I've set up my life materially isn't really so, isn't favorable to my Krishna consciousness. It's a lot hard. It makes, we've made our lives a lot harder than they often need to be. Yeah. And when we try to speak to others, we don't have the, you know, the uh, Hadikari to convince others because we're living different than what we're saying. For example, um, milk. Now, there are people who will criticize us for drinking milk that are coming from uh, secular societies because of these cows will eventually be slaughtered. So when we say, well, we have to have milk, so we're taking milk. But then again, if we have a hymns of milk, we have our own cows, then we can say, well, these cows are protected. They're never going to be killed in any sense of the way. The milk is actually quality milk. It's not store-bought white water that you get. We call, they call it milk. It's full of chemicals. So if we're somehow or other not living up to the standard that we're talking to, then people will not take us seriously. And of course, we're falling, as you mentioned, when it becomes too hard to practice Krishna consciousness, we think, well, um, it's easier to go the other route. And it's more natural and more normal. So we've been talking about this for 50 years now. <laughs> and uh, so I think it's about time and the social environment is pushing us that we need to re start to reestablish this the consciousness that is necessary for moving out of our present situation into a situation which is conducive to practicing Krishna consciousness.
Marsh, can I ask a question on that? Yeah. So one of the things that we see, and I think this is the case with many of us, is that because we've grown up in a society which is very complex in many ways, and because in our day-to-day -day lifestyle we've, we've taken on those complexities that we've grown up with, what are some ways in which devotees, because I can see that it may not be a, a shift, a complete shift or transition overnight, but what are some of the things that devotees can do so that they are, so that we are less attached to some of the complexities in life and also prepare a consciousness so we're, we're able to live more simply and to not be dependent on so many external things so that as things change, we're not so much thrown by the, by the shift. What can we do to prepare our consciousness in that regard? Oh, you mean from in a day-to-day -day lifestyle? Um, yeah, just generally or anything over, over time. Because I imagine that many people, even on the call, may be very attached to certain ways of doing things, external things. And they know the philosophy. They know that this is where we should be preparing ourselves. But they're not there yet. And the conditioning is still very much... Um, program to be attached to so many external things. What can be done to kind of move the consciousness more in the direct, direction of being able to live simply and also have that higher thinking? Well, you can't live simply in these cities. It's just not possible. <laughs> I think it's about preparing our consciousness for the transition and not so much immediately trying to, you know, just walk out of your everything and then go to a farm and live. It's gradually understanding and then visiting these different farm communities that are developing in that way and learning the lifestyle and seeing how either we could set it up individually within, the, within our, our particular area or leaving and then actually becoming part of these different communities that are already developing um, on a day-to-day -day value basis. Um, well, I mean, a hymns of milk is one thing. Growing your own food is another thing. Um, what else? Uh, educating your children. Don't send them to, to public schools. Just recently, two years ago, in the area I am, they changed the law now that uh, parents can homeschool their children. Due to the communist system, that wasn't allowed and it stayed in place up until two years ago. And now educating children at home. I mean, when mothers think, oh my God, how am I gonna do that? But I, I know a few mothers who do that and they're very happy. And the kids are also getting good education. They're getting secular uh, studies and they're also getting Krishna conscious values. Uh, community is the basis of happiness. Living in these little apartment boxes, we can establish a community when we all live in one apartment house maybe <laughs> and somehow other can associate with each other. Well, who do we associate with? We live mostly in a society that's, you know, we have our house and next door, and all around us are all secular people. And they're all common people like that. We don't even know who they are sometimes. And their lifestyle is completely contrary to ours. So what I'm trying to Awaken is that Prabhupada's vision for the future means gradually moving away from what we are into that ideal lifestyle. And, and see, making a plan on how to do it. And they were doing little things from day to day to distance ourselves from the values like that, such as educating our children. Uh, getting involved with proper eating, proper dietary, not plugging into the secular society for everything we need. Mm -hmm. 
some of our temples are trying to establish a more natural type of energy sources, setting up solar panels and things like that. We don't have to become dependent on electricity completely anymore. It's a gradual transition away, but you'll see that there are communities, even secular communities around the world that have to distance themselves from the, from the uh, social environment that goes on as the general way to, for people to live. We can learn from these communities also. Thank you, Marge. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sure you can think of a few things too. I'm just making notes from everything you're saying, Marge. But yeah, it, it makes complete sense. It makes complete sense. And, and I recall from, um, from previous conversations, as you also talked about the importance of even being in line with the natural cycle, so sleeping early, rising early, so that we're kind of putting our, 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 our mind more in touch with nature in that in that sense and using the early morning period for the chanting. Because in the sense of when we, as we get purified, we're less attached to so many of these external things as well, because because we're we're experiencing that that deeper fulfillment in our Krishna consciousness internally. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're being forced to move away from the values of society now. It's good in that sense. Um, yeah, there was something else I wanted to say. But, uh, We, we look around and we think, well, what can I do as a family? Well, we can investigate more in, into this lifestyle. Even living in a rural community, even if it's not a farm community, but if it's a more rural type of atmosphere, can also be conducive to a more simplified type of lifestyle and getting away from all the uh, requirements that the social environment has. Right now there's chaos in the world, although there is a, there's a lot of rules and regulations going on now. People are rebelling against all of this stuff. There's a lot of dissatisfaction. The news is not reporting any of it because they don't really want people to know what's happening. But uh, behind the scenes, there are a lot of things that are going on. Yeah. Mm. There's demonstrations, there's refusals to follow the rules and regulations of this lockdown. There's so many things going on. And you, the only way you can find out about what's going on is you have to go to alternate news or you'll have to go to see what is actually happening. The society is crumbling really fast. And as society crumbles, martial law becomes more and more the state of affairs where the governments, in order to suppress, they take, they, they take to military uh, arrangements to control problems and people. So, uh, yeah. It's not a good thing. That's why if we don't have to have to be plugged into this society, we don't have to be part of all this chaos. And we can demonstrate what is the ideal lifestyle. I'm not a farm person. I lived in New Vrindavan from 1973 to 1993, 20 years in New Vrindavan. Uh, there was a couple years that I went to other places and did some uh, preaching. I was in pre preaching in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1987, 88, 89 in Columbus in 1990, in 91, 92, also in Boston, Massachusetts for a few years. But mostly I was on the farm. And... Uh, I'm not a farm person. 
<laughs> I'm not a person who is really conducive to that type of lifestyle. I've always been brought up in the cities and I'm used to it. And, uh, but I also see the benefit of it. And that's the point. I can see what Prabhupada is saying and I can see the benefit of it, even though my nature is a little bit different. Thank you. Guru Any Maharaj. other comments or questions? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Um, we have uh, one question from Anjali Singh Mataji. Uh, Mataji, you want to unmute yourself and ask the question, or shall I read it out? Okay. So um, here's the question, Guru Maharaj. So she is asking how to how do we create unity or cooperation in building this goal to have farm communities in our local area. During COVID, non-devotees yeah. are moving to rural areas, having a simpler lifestyle. However, our ISKCON congregations still don't feel urgency <clears throat> to, un <clears throat> to unite together and build farm communities. Well, the whole, the whole secular society is making sure people don't unite. That's one of the reasons why there's a lockdown. Because <laughs> they don't want people to come together and talk. <laughs> You know, keep you by yourself and keep you in your own world of, uh, you know, struggle. But as soon as you bind together with other people and start talking, then you start thinking of solutions to it. That's why they close down bars and restaurants, because that's where people congregate and talk together. That's one of the reasons they don't want that. They want to keep people separate. So they buy into this whole thing that's going on. So yeah, we're fighting against uh, you know the particular social environment, but devotees come together and discuss this. And through the discussion, some practical plan can also be developed. But then again, it requires leadership, people who are in leadership, who have resources, who can do things, who can mobilize other people they need to be the persons who are really leading this whole thing. We can do it on a smaller scale. And that is a few families living together, getting a plot of land and having, them. but then again, that takes some time, some energy, some resources. So right now we're in a little bit of a, uh, uh, not a little bit, kind of an awkward situation on how to change because restrictions are forcing a, a lack of association. The only way we can associate is like what we're doing now. That's pretty much it. We can. Well, there is some movement, but it's limited and it's always subject to change. Mm -hmm. So, solutions are there, but it requires a plan and requires cooperation amongst, it requires some leadership, some guidance, some understanding of the individual situation, but gradually, gradually. But keep up your Krishna consciousness. That's the most important thing. Not all solutions are through you know, changing the environment. The solutions there are also, the, the more we become Krishna conscious, the more we can see how to live our life and distance ourselves from all the effects of the present materialistic society. Especially the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra will give us complete shelter and protection. And I don't say that as a, just a, a phrase within a larger statement. The Holy Name will give complete protection and shelter, complete, as long as we are regularly chanting and taking full shelter of Krishna's Holy Name. The devotees will always be in a good position, not to be affected with by things going on. 
The problem is we're still plugged in to a lifestyle that causes us problems. <laughs> And that's the problem. We have to keep dealing with the problems due to the way we live. That's not nice. But if you take shelter of Krishna's holy name, you can somehow or other continue without being, you know, defeated. Krishna will protect his devotees. There's no doubt about that. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Um, we have, uh, I have uh, two questions uh, from Sri Devi Mataji. Uh, Sri Devi Mataji, would you like to ask your questions? Uh, and... uh, you can read them all for me, Lavanya, please. Yes, Mataji. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my most humble obeisances, all glories to Srila Prabhupada and Your Holiness. It seems that we are talking about something very timely for me. Today evening at interfaith event, I am asked to speak to a group of youngsters on food, faith and the climate. I am not sure how to present our philosophy without coming off as though I am preaching everyone becomes a Hare Krishna. Your guidance is deeply appreciated. Hey, speak the values that we, we live. You don't have to speak so much about the, the, the spiritual aspect. Talk about the values. <clears throat> what are our values? Here, for example, climate. And so if people are polluted, they pollute the environment. So change people's consciousness, you change the environment. <laughs> the environment is an extension of the, the polluted consciousness of the, of the people in, in that environment. So that's climate control. <laughs> teach spiritual values and not so much preaching uh, pre preaching about, well, you have to join this organization and you have to do this. Everyone can identify with, with ideal values, human values, spiritual values. Talk about these things, the values that make up our lifestyle which are extensions of our practice of Krishna consciousness. And this is what people are looking for. Not so much plans for social change. Plans for social change will only bring more problems. Talk about changing the consciousness of the people through adopting spiritual principles, spiritual values, these are, these are the more, Bhutta Bhavana, you can speak on this better than I can, because <laughs> you this is what you do all the time. So maybe you, if you feel inspired, I would, we would like to hear something in this regard. All right, you're the expert, but I'll just, I'll just continue from where you, what you've shared already. Because I, I was making some notes, and, and yeah, the, the whole point about the values, will I, will I learn from, from just observing my spiritual master, Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj, as John Maharaj just rightly said, he looked to see where are the points of connection. So, you know, so when there's values that people can relate to, so something that's relatable, something that's relevant to them, and also is in line with our Krishna consciousness. And then linking to what John Maharaj said earlier, that Prabhupada said this is a cultural movement for the re-spiritualization of the world society. There are always various aspects of our, of our cultural movement that have relevance to every area of people's lives and so so um Shudevi, i'll just suggest that you yeah, really meditate on that so what are the values within our tradition that are relevant to the audience that can relate to the audience and that can give insight on the real issue or a real concern that they have and then in that way they can make a connection with, our, with the teach with at least that aspect of the teachings and what tends to happen is that then some of them will be more inclined or interested in finding out what else the philosophy or the tradition says, but at least they're, they're favorable. So it takes them in that direction. Sri Devi, what do you think? 
Um, I think uh, what Bhuta Bharna Prabhu said really resonates with me. So I'm picking up a lot of clues about how to make a presentation which will you know, strike a chord in my audience because I'm really wanting to be careful as I speak. This is something very new for me. I've not done this before it's the first time. So I really appreciate these uh, pointers. Thank you, Prabhu. And thank you. Try to just try to remember the values we live by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Remember the, yeah, the values we live by. Mm -hmm. I really like the point you made, Guru Maharaj, about how this environmental crisis is actually a spiritual crisis. It's a lack of Krishna consciousness, lack of God consciousness at all levels. So that's the first thing that I really picked up. I think I'm going to expand from there and bring up all the other things. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Give us your report at the tomorrow. <laughs> By your blessings and mercy, Guru Maharaj. By your blessings and mercy only. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj, and thank you, Bhuta Bhavana Prabhu. Um, Mataji has one more question. Uh, what would Guru Maharaj like us to do as a God family to help with instituting uh, Varnashrama, come, to, come together to start a farm community, and if so, where? Practical. <laughs> well, first of all, convince yourself <laughs> that it's what you want to do and what you want to propagate. After you've, you're convinced, then just speak to people and get ideas. Communication is the first principle before any plan starts to unfold. Communication, gathering support, gathering resources. When learning more about what we already have in our society that is of that nature and learning from that. I suggest the devotees go visit these if you can. I mean, travel is a little difficult now. But that's one of the ways is to visit these places. Govardhan Echo Village, Saranagati in Canada. Um, we have a place in Slovenia here, Mr. Indy. He's got his farm. You can see him waving his hand. Go, go visit him in Slovenia. Um, Croatia, we have... Divya Prabhanda, he's hardworking, he's developing self-sufficiency. Um, other places, Gita Nagari is very big in that area. Spend some time in these places. Instead of making your vacation, you know, the the seashore, make your vacation a farm community. And we have, um, of course, Bhakti Vedanta Manor in London. It's got a little bit of that self-sufficiency moving, although it's just one area and that's mostly cow protection. But that, that environment is also uh, ripe for development in that area. There's a lot of places you can go and visit or read about them. Talk about it. Talk, talk to people. In other There's words, for, for those, who, those who are preachers, they can make this their subject matter for preaching in their classes. 
And those who are just very social and have interconnection with other devotees and other people, they can speak about this. This can helps to convince you and it also might enlighten, might inspire someone else to do something also. If you just keep it quiet, then nothing happens. So that means we begin speaking about it after we get convinced ourselves and try to see how other people would also like to join in with that. Is that what your holiness is suggesting? I'm, I'm assuming you're already convinced. I'm a, <laughs> yes, Guru <laughs> but you so. said that. <laughs> yes, I am definitely convinced, no doubts about it. Okay. Um, wondering what, how do we in our god family what should be the next step well how about chandra Prabhu? would you like to enlighten us with some of these uh, points of discussion here turn on your video turn on your audio Hare krishna maharaj please accept my obeisances all glories all glories all glories to the god family I, a couple of good points that, of course, I heard from uh, Buddha Bhavana. He said some very nice things. I, I was thinking about there needs to be some reframing about our point of entry. Um, and what I mean by that, um, because there's a lot of quish, questions on how, how to, how do we do this? Um, as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, am I actually satisfied? where I am right now. And I think it's an obvious question for me. No, I'm not satisfied where I'm at. So what is it that I can do that can bring the level of satisfaction up? And so getting back to values, as you were mentioning, Bhutta Bhavana, I was thinking of my guru. This is, you know, now when I hear questions or issues, I always think of Guru Dave. And I always think about how he would address a, a, a circumstance. And I was thinking many, many moons ago when you and I were at a Seventh-day Adventist uh, program in Cleveland. And you and I were talking, we were like, look at him work, <laughs> this, the audience, you know. So I think we have to start developing a skill to understand the audience that we're speaking to. And... <clears throat> What I mean by that, we have to raise our antenna and learn how to tune in to how to address the need. So everybody said, we, we need grains. Well, I happen to know a few people that have a silo that have grains. So we have to understand us as we are spiritual counselors. So rather than just giving a blanket solution to something or something that's scripted, we have to listen to the whatever adjustments needs to be made. And that's our point of entry. So I, I was I was thinking just recently, I have a coworker who's um, he's a LDS or Mormon. And we have these conversations. And generally, when two people in different disciplines get together, it comes down to who's going to win. And I get to the the point where it's not about winning, it's about a point of entry. So where do we have some common ground? So it takes a lot of listening. So even though you may not necessarily agree with a lot of their concepts, if you let people talk long enough, they're gonna ask you a question. Like, what do you think? <laughs> and, you, and then you just reflect back some of the things that they were saying, this is this point of entry or the common value is Buddha Bhavana. Uh, you know, he, he reflects on. So you start picking on those things and then you can start, well, this is, you know, I, I, I agree with this. This is what we do, particularly on diet. So I had been pushing, um, you know, the concept that, you know, we, sh we really shouldn't be eating flesh. So rather than it seeming preaching, I was coming from a scientific standpoint because Krishna consciousness is not a religion. It's a science. And if we start approaching it from that, <clears throat> from that aspect that it's a science, then I think people can understand. 
The other thing too, I think that helps us to move in that direction is we have the Krishna factor. I'm getting older and my body is not, <laughs> you know, cooperating. So I'm kind of forced to do some things to make some adjustments uh, for, from a standpoint of Vanar Ashram or, or, or things of that nature. And so there, you can actually embrace those things because you're looking for help. So I think if we just listen to the people that we're going to um, converse with about what their issues are and do it like a counselor, then I think we can kind of understand what we can offer in terms of value. And I think that's really yeah. important. So I'm working in a prison environment. I, 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 some of the stuff that I have to deal with just this week in terms of people about some kind of spiritual faith that I never even heard of, and I'm gonna have to do a little research on it. But I was, I came and encountered a person like that. And he was actually trying to convert me. And I said, you know, I'm not really interested in conversion. I'm just really interested in what you, what you're offering, what you're saying, and where's the, where's the compatibility. So rather than what, where do we have a point of entry? Where do we, where do we have some common ground? And I said, so let's find what we can support each other in and move on from there. So you just have to use some maturity because you're not going to be able, some people are going to come to you. Can you help me? And other people want to come to you. I need to change you. <laughs> so we have to understand even in this age, because the heightened desperateness of individuals because of the pandemic are pushing a lot more extreme uh, behaviors, extreme thought. A lot of this is happening. So we just have to just slow down, be patient. I kind of uh, liken it to Tai Chi. Tai Chi is not a fast paced thing. It's you actually work slow, but when you have to react, you can move fast. So this is how I kind of look at how our responsibilities in Krishna consciousness. And then the last thing on, on you know, building community, you know, we need to get together. One person can say, you know, I'll build a garden and we can co-opt. Maybe we can do that in the city until we can move to the next phase of finding some land. And I'm actually been looking for land, um, you know, cause I'm in the process of, you know, trying to get into retirement. So I'm looking for land. So one of the things you can do is just look up real estate, just start looking at things. And as um, I thought of the concept, desire creates a behavior, which translates into circumstances. So this is Krishna consciousness. This is this, you know, uh, 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 Krishna talks about this to Arjuna when he's talking about why do we have this lust? I mean, what what is the what's the rationale behind it? So we have to change your desire, and we've been programmed for so long. So now we just need to be in this association, and this is a good environment to do this. So if we do this more often, then it kind of sparks the desire to move forward and look at something, hey, well, what are you doing? I'm looking at real estate, I'm online, or I know a lawyer, or I know someone who's doing a 501c3. We're just picking up skills this way. So I'll, I'll just stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I like your point about the point of entry because that gives us a, a real strong voice. When you start to learn to listen and you pick up what is their mindset, not only their mindset, the mood behind the mindset, there's always something Krishna consciousness that can relate to that. And then you have something to say. And it complements their, what they're saying, but at the same time, it takes them to, a, to another thought process, which allows them to understand something that they don't understand. Yeah. I found that very effective in preaching also, just listening. And then until the person is done and then you speak, <laughs> then they're ready to hear. When you go back and forth, nobody's listening. <laughs> Generally, that's the case. Thank you. Nice to see you. I hope, your, I hope your health is good. It's improving with the, with the blessings of my guru, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> <Jai>. <laughs> 
Janikinath, are you able to say anything? Okay. We'll, uh, we'll reserve you. Yeah, Would you like to say something? I have so much stuff to say, but my voice is gone still. Oh, okay. Uh, so when you feel ready to speak, then maybe tomorrow if you can come up with something. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a lot of singing practice to get my voice back. Okay. We hope we pray you get your voice back because you have a lot to say. <laughs> Anyone else would like to either say something? It's not necessarily that you have to ask a question, but if you have some opinion or some ideas, something that you want to offer, please. Maharaj, it's me. Uh, I would like to say something. Uh, maybe some advice is to Chandra does uh, regarding uh, looking for the land. While you are looking for the land, take also time to start to get knowledge because when you will get land, uh, you will already have to make it in the practice and uh, just getting land, it's just first step. And in this period where you are looking, try to learn how to do, for example, permaculture is really good stuff. Or maybe in uh, Ayurveda, it's also one type of um, uh, agriculture, but I'm not familiar with it. I actually build the whole thing with permaculture uh, principles, which are really similar. And uh, I don't know, I'm really willing to offer help to anybody because I have a big library of knowledge, which I collect during last 10, years or maybe a little bit more uh, and uh, just walk the talk don't wait don't ask yourself how uh, just start find the land bought it i bought my land in one really critical situation when i lost job i was full of fear what will happen because i had this law for the apartment i bought bought and i couldn't pay anymore the mortgage and i decided okay i will invest in land at the end of the day, actually, the whole story finished nicely also with the, the apartment and also with this land. But uh, I put all energy actually in this. This actually changed me uh, through the mortgage. I start to live completely different. So I changed my way of life. Uh, I did also the um, other uh, uh, transitions also with the food and everything. So. Now with the bhakti, actually, I'm upgrading the existing knowledge through the prisma of Vedic knowledge. And uh, if anybody needs really good stuff, I have a lot of it. I mean, a lot. I will just give the pearls just to get the knowledge which will push you further in these communities uh, that are self-sufficiency. For example, last year, I also built uh, my own electricity plant and uh, I don't know. It's really simple. It's a lot of on YouTube. Uh, you can do it. People already do it. They are not into the consciousness yet, but uh, there is a big movement also in this field. Thank you for uh, having a word to all of you. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you uh, for giving that information and also providing resources and um, your time and energy for anyone who would like to learn more or actually do something. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Uh, so we are almost at the end of our first session today. Um, so um, shall we stop here, Guru Maharaj? Or do you want to take more question? Yeah. So the uh, next session in, in announce what's upcoming. Yes, Guru Maharaj. So the next session will be at four o'clock. Uh, 4 p.m. UK time, and uh, His Grace Bhuta Bhavana Prabhu will be doing the next session on uh, the uh, purposes of um, ISKCON. So on the topic of the uh, purpose of ISKCON. So, so we are going to continue the next session at four o'clock, Guru Maharaj. So thank you everyone for joining today. Um, thank you, Guru Maharaj, for the lovely session today. And thank you, Bhuta Bhavana Prabhu and Chandra Prabhu for uh, bringing your inputs. Um, Thank you so much. 
And uh, on behalf of our retreat team, um, I just offer my obeisances, all of our obeisances. Vancha kalpata rupyascha, kripa sindhu pevacha, patita nam pavane pya. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll see you again in the next session um, in the afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of the devotees. Thank you for showing a very active interest. Okay, we'll see everyone in about um, two hours. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru. Thank you, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Dev. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. 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 Hare Krishna